Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Come and fill our hearts with the fullness of your joy. And come to us, O oh God, and meet us as we turn our hearts towards you. Amen. So one of my most um, distinct memories from my childhood is when I was about seven or eight years old. And I have this um, just vivid memory of standing outside of our family home on Jody Street in Maryland. And it wasn't a fancy house, it was like kind of a small, very simple little house that we had, but it had these really beautiful flowering branches and bushes all around it, these like beautiful flowery trees. And I remember that it had just like poured rain and I went outside and in that moment, it was like all of my senses were heightened, like everything was so just beautiful and vibrant and the colors of the trees and the grass were so vivid. And I remember this feeling that just rose up in me, it, was, it welled up in me. And while I couldn't articulate it at the time, now looking back, I know that that feeling was longing. It was a longing for something you know, bigger than myself, even bigger than that moment, but just yearning for something that I couldn't quite name. So many years later, I read the autobiography of C.S. Lewis, you know, the, the great author and theologian, and he was describing, it was literally like almost like the identical exact experience that he had as a child. And he was also standing next to these flowering bushes on a beautiful summer day. And what he says is, he says in that moment, he said, it's difficult to find words strong enough for the sensation which came over me. Milton's enormous bliss of Eden, giving the full ancient meaning to enormous, comes somewhere near it. It was a sensation, of course, of desire, but desire for what? Before I knew what I desired, the desire itself was gone, the whole glimpse withdrawn, the world turned commonplace again, and only stirred by a longing for the longing that had just ceased. It had taken only a moment of time, and in a certain sense, everything else that had ever happened to me was insignificant in comparison. Like, do you know that longing? You know, I just, if you even think back to your own childhood or even more recently, that longing that I'm talking about, that C.S. Lewis is talking about, like, of course you do. Like, I'm being a little, pres I'm not normally that presumptuous of a person, but I'm being presumptuous here because you are all human. We all have that longing for something bigger and greater and deeper than ourselves. Like as St. Augustine famously said, he said that you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And C.S. Lewis called that experience joy. So his, his autobiography is called Surprised by Joy. And he defines it as this. He says joy must have the stab the pang, the inconsolable longing. Why? Why is that? Because in the end, joy and our experience of it, as imperfect as it may be in this life, is about wholeness. It's the deepest, truest part of ourselves, tasting something, getting a glimpse of something, of what it means to be whole of what it means for our world and our relationships and ourselves to be whole. It's what the biblical writers called shalom. We translate it as peace in English, but it's so much richer than just that word peace. It means wholeness, flourishing, well-being, tranquility, right relationships. In other words, things as they were meant to be. So in our lectionary readings for this morning, they paint this poetic and prophetic picture of what this wholeness looks like. 
So in Isaiah, the prophet says that the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad, the desert shall rejoice and blossom, like the crocus it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, everlasting joy shall be upon their heads, and they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And then we've got Mary singing out where she says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. The almighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel for he has remembered his promise of mercy. We've got Jesus saying to the disciples of John, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. In other words, wholeness. You know, that moment when I was standing in front of my childhood home on Jody Street, like at the time, I was being bullied at my new school in the suburbs. And some of you have heard me share the story of being the child of Korean immigrants in the 70s and moving to this predominantly white school where I was mercilessly bullied and picked on and called racial slurs in the way that kids can just be so cruel. And I just remember being this like really happy and carefree kid until then, and then starting to turn inward and disappear. That's when I began shape-shifting in order to please others, and to be accepted, to be loved. And it was my first experience of brokenness in this world, of what it meant to feel pain, to feel rejected, to feel myself start to splinter and to fracture. And when I encountered beauty in that moment, in my world that, that felt so painful to my seven-year-old heart, it was like getting a glimpse of this wholeness that I longed for, this beauty that in my world that I longed for, and that to this day as an adult that I long for, that I still do. You know, when I think about the most joyful people that I know, and tell me if you think about this in your own life too, the most joyful people that I know are often the people who have suffered the most. Right? I'm not talking about like happy, clappy, like pie in the sky people. I'm talking people who are truly joyful in that deep, sort of well in their soul kind of ways that often they've experienced unimaginable tragedy and sorrow in their lives. And it's as if that this, the sorrow that they've experienced, like painful as it is, has carved this deep well in them that increases their capacity for joy. You know, there's no like selective numbing with them. That's what Brene Brown calls it, where it's like you try to numb like sadness and grief and anger. You can't numb your capacity for sorrow, she says, without numbing your capacity for joy. It doesn't work that way. And folks like this, they see the brutal facts of reality with these clear eyes while at the same time holding on to this steadfast hope and faith in God. And it's this wholeheartedness that mirrors the wholeheartedness of God. It's the wholeheartedness of Mary. And when you read her story, like who would ever deny that Mary knew both joy and sorrow? in the course of her life. Like here she is, she's this unwed, pregnant teenage girl living in a time and culture that did not look kindly on unwed, pregnant teenage girls. She was a poor Palestinian Jew whose country was being occupied by a brutal Roman empire. And yet here she is, and she's singing this song that is just bursting out of her. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. Singing about the mighty being thrown down from their thrones and the hungry being filled with good things. In the meantime, being surrounded by the mighty on their thrones and the hungry being hungry. Like how could she sing 
with this kind of joy. Now, what does it mean to magnify something? You ever think about that? You know, what does it mean to magnify something? That word magnify means to enlarge, to increase, to exalt. When she says that my soul magnifies the Lord, it kind of doesn't make sense because the Lord is already exalted. The Lord is already great. The Lord is already bigger than our minds could ever conceive. But notice here, what she says is, my soul magnifies the Lord. She's talking about the perspective of her soul, the way that her soul sees the Lord. You know, we have all these um, instruments that help us magnify things, right? Like stars, if you're like looking at a little ant, you know, on the ground. And a star, like millions of miles away, can seem just so huge, like right in front of your face. And this like tiny little ant, you know, under a magnifying glass, looks big enough like it could bite your hand off. So as we like think about this, this theme of joy today, it's worth asking ourselves, what is my soul magnifying? What is your soul magnifying this morning? I mean, for Mary, it could have been the magnifying the shame and the condemnation that she surely experienced as a result of being pregnant and unwed. What could have been magnified was the despair of being an oppressed person living in a system that was designed to crush them, to dehumanize them. What is your soul magnifying? What is dominating the landscape of your consciousness? And in this song, what Mary is saying is there is a reality out there. There's a reality out there that is greater, something more at work in the world. There is someone who is coming, who is making me and making the world more whole. And that is why my soul magnifies the Lord, that my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. It's this wholehearted worship. And in that word rejoice, like in the original language, biblical language, it literally means to leap for joy. So it's the same word that Elizabeth uses just a, a few verses earlier when she says to Mary, you know, when you entered into my home, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Like, it can also be translated dancing. You know, I mean, don't you love that picture? Dancing for joy. And what that says to me is that joy isn't just about this intellectual assent to some truth. Rather, it's embodied. We feel it. It's claiming in this physical body, in this physical world, in the here and now, a prophetic reality. You know, in the words of Grace Lee Boggs, a great activist, who said, it's claiming that prophetic reality that another world is possible, another world is necessary, and another world is already here. And acting like that is true. So, you know, back in 2016, it was like the end of 2016, um, at my former church, um, we went through just a really, really terrible and challenging crisis surrounding the departure of our beloved rector. And suddenly I was thrust into the season of having to lead our community, grieving, angry, scared, while I myself was grieving and angry and scared and just not knowing what the future was going to hold. Um, just like, just feeling like the, 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 the ground had sort of disappeared from under me. And if you remember too, that was 2016. We had just had a presidential election. And it was this in-between time when you know, we were getting ready for the presidential inauguration. And I can't tell you if you can remember from that time what it was like to hear our next president, the man who would be our next president, who had boasted about assaulting women, among many other things, and imagining this person as the leader of our country. And just how much despair there was in that season, in, in some quarters of our country. So it was January, the inauguration was coming up, and I used to drive my niece, Sophia, who was probably five or six at the time, to school. And I was exhausted. You know, I like wasn't sleeping, um, I was tense, I wasn't eating well, I was just so tired. 
And I remember um, driving her down FDR, and she was like listening to this, what was his name? It was just one of these like kids, like song people. And I forget what his name was. It was like Perry, Gary, Gary Perry or something like that. And he, he like, you know, had these like really silly songs about like um, chipmunks eating tacos and you know, just songs like that. I mean, which normally drove me crazy. But in this moment, she would get really into it and just like start kind of bopping around. And um, so that was like our thing, you know, where I would try to get into spirit and also kind of bop around with her, with them. And, um, and so I remember like this one moment as we were bopping down FDR and just this feeling where I was like, I need to dance. Like, I just need to dance. It was like this like guttural need that I had to dance. And so we organized this dance at All Angels. It was Epiphany, and so we called it Light Up the Night. And we're just like, you know what, like, let's just, it's been such a hard season, like, let's just get together and just dance. And let me tell you, I danced like a crazy woman that night. It started off with like Katy Perry's roar, and it ended two hours later with me having pulled the microphone off its cord, dancing like a crazy woman to Prince's Let's Go Crazy. And I didn't even go to the bathroom, and I always have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> it was just, and it's like I clearly needed to get something like out of my system, and we all just danced like crazy. And in this moment, what it felt like was, it was almost like dancing for survival's sake. Like we didn't dance, like something was just gonna pull us down into the ground. Like I was gonna be engulfed by this grief and this pain. And there was something that later on, it kind of came to me as like dancing as a prophetic act. You know, it seems like such a silly thing, such a frivolous thing sometimes, but it's actually not. And even when you think about the history of oppressed peoples, that dancing has often been like at the center of it because it's this embodied experience. It's like you're living in this body and you are saying, this is not all there is. There is a reality out there that is greater than the pain and the sorrow that we're experiencing right now. And we're going to claim that reality. and We're going to call that reality into existence right here and right now. You know, it makes me the other moment that I thought of was, do you remember during lockdown and the pandemic, do you guys remember the 7, 7 p.m. hand clap? <laughs> do you remember that? You know, sometimes things come to mind that happened during the pandemic where I was like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot about that. And if you remember, we were all hanging out of our windows, screaming, clapping, like even Jimmy, who's like totally, this is like totally not his thing. He was like banging the pots, you know, out the window, you know, saying thank you, you know, letting our hearts be full of gratitude for in the midst of this horrible, painful, dark time, saying thank you to these essential workers who were serving us and helping us. And there was something about just hearing the, the, the clapping and the cheering and the sound of those pots and the, just whatever you had in your house to make noise with and hearing that just all across the city. It was like this embodied solidarity that we had with each other. And it was a sense of like, we are not alone in this. We are in this together. And that this is not going to be the end of the story, you know, and we are claiming that here and now. And we're not pretending like things aren't horrible and scary and dark. And yet we are coming together in this moment to say, we see you, we care about you, we're grateful for you. And being human together, that is a glimpse of that wholeness and that reality that I'm talking about, where we see glimpses of it. And like, even now, as I think about that time, you know, there's like longing in my heart, right? Like right after 9-11, the way that the city came together, in the middle of the pandemic, the way the city came together, and saying most of the time we don't live like that, and yet we have these glimpses. And that longing just makes you long for more. You know, there's this um, the poet, Ross Gay, he just came out with this book called Inciting Joy. And he says, what does joy incite? My hunch is that joy is an ember for, or precursor to, wild and unpredictable and unboundaried solidarity. 
and that that solidarity might incite further joy, which might incite further solidarity, and on and on. My, my hunch is that joy emerging from our common sorrow might draw us together. It might even depolarize us enough that we consider what in common we love. A longing and just wholeness and wholeheartedness and this embodied solidarity, all of those things that make up the joy that is our inheritance. You know, joy, it's a gift. You know, joy and the word grace, which is, it comes from that same root word of gift. Joy is a gift, but I believe it is also an act of the will. It's also a practice. It's also something that sometimes we have to fight for, you know, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And like Mary in that moment, put a stake in the ground and say, another world is possible, another world is necessary, and another world is already here. And I'm going to live like that is true. And so I want to invite us into a moment of just reflection, just for like 60 seconds. And I want you to just take a moment and allow yourself to just feel what are you longing for? And maybe it's even like longing for a longing. Just allow yourself to feel that longing. Maybe it's just for, for healing in your own life or healing in the life of someone you love. You know, maybe it's just longing to see our world more healed and whole. And not to do that selective numbing, you know, where you're afraid of disappointment, afraid to even name it to yourself. But just to say, God, I, this is what I long for. And I just want to touch that wholeness that I know is there in me, in others, and in our world. Just hold on to that, that longing that you name. And then I want you to, too, to just think about, well, so what has been dominating the landscape of your consciousness? What has your soul been magnifying these days? You know, maybe it's like another person that sort of represents this presence, you know, that's causing you fear, anxiety, whatever it may be. You know, maybe it's some situation that you're facing or something happening in our country or in our world that's just dominating. And just in your heart, you know, if you, if you can, if you feel able, that maybe it's prophesying to yourself this morning. You know, just prophesying to your own soul and claiming what your soul knows is true. And just be able to say, whether you feel like it's true or not, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. He sees me, for he knows me, and he sees where I'm at. He sees our world and looks with favor with love, with delight. And maybe we need to prophesy you know, to whatever brokenness it is that we see. And just like Jesus said to John, you know, go and tell John what you see. That the blind receive their sight and the lame walk, and lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and good news is preached to the poor. 
and we claim that in the here and in the now. And so God, we come to you this morning. And I know that I didn't feel that joyful waking up. But I just pray for myself. I pray for each person in this room within the reach of my voice. God, would you come and just fill us with your joy. Would give us that grace. We receive that joy as our inheritance and we claim it. And we just pray, would you silence the voice of the evil one who comes to steal and kill and destroy. And God, we pray, would you open wide our own deaf ears, our own blind eyes, that we can see and hear the one who has come, is coming, and is here right now. Heal us, oh God, make us whole. Heal our world, O oh God, and make our world whole. We love you and we bless you. In the name of Jesus, amen.